It was November, the ground was covered in snow, and the pilgrims needed to find a settlement site. Miles Standish took the lead, and a group of ten settlers, along with the Mayflower's captain, Christopher Jones, trekked through water and then snow. The sea's spray froze to their clothes as if they'd been glazed, but fortunately they had plenty of geese and ducks to, to eat, and they found clean water when they were thirsty. They trekked miles and saw their first glimpses of the locals who darted into the woods when they saw them. You're listening to the American History Podcast with Sarah Tungsalvola, the show exploring who we are and why by tracing American history from the 17th century to the 20th. Stephen Hopkins was able to identify a deer trap based on his time in Jamestown. They also found some storage pits filled with corn. Low on food, they decided to take the corn as well as some of the best items from the graves. They planned to compensate the owners with beads and trinkets with beads and trinkets from England, but they forgot to. Miles Standish would end up taking a central role during his time in Plymouth, simultaneously being one of the colony's most contentious figures and one of the people that the Leiden separatists in particular grew to depend on the most, along with Brewster, Bradford, and Carver. It's worth taking a couple minutes to introduce the Plymouth captain. He wasn't a pilgrim, but he was in Leiden at the same time that the pilgrims had been, and he had worked for the Calvinist leaders of the city. He had certainly met John Robinson and some other members of his congregation. He was also connected to Pocock's Honorable Artillery Company, which is how he had gotten involved in the mission. Standish's Puritan credentials were strong, and he was well-educated and well-read, but he had a major chip on his shoulder. He was from Duxbury in Lancashire, just a little north of Manchester, and he said that he was descended from the house of Standish of Standish, but that he'd been cheated out of his, in- out of his inheritance and forced to seek his fortune as a mercenary in Holland. He was also short enough that he had to shorten his sword blade by four inches to keep it from dragging on the ground, and he was just a very proud person and very quick to take offense. And it was it was this tendency that started to ruffle feathers. John Robinson was very harsh in his assessment of Standish's character, saying that he didn't show the love of God in his interaction with other people. John Smith would later lament that the Pilgrims could have avoided a lot of the problems they faced if they'd hired him instead of Standish, because Standish wouldn't even consult his maps while they were out exploring. As the Pilgrims looked to an uncertain future, though, Standish's brash and bold style instilled a confidence that they needed. Christopher Jones became the first person that Standish clashed with. At the second potential settlement location, they trekked through six inches of snow, and when the site seemed to be unsuitable, they went to get the rest of the corn that they'd found earlier, and Jones pushed for them all to return to the Mayflower, while Standish wanted to push ahead. Jones decided to take the corn and the sicker men back to the ship, leaving Standish in charge of the rest for the night. Standish went looking for Indians, but found nothing, and the remaining pilgrims decided to dig up some of the local graves to investigate them. There, they found the bones of a European sailor and a young child, and they ended up taking some of the best things from the graves again, and from a local uninhabited village. Again, they forgot to leave the beads that they intended for payment. With nothing more to be done at the second failed location, though, they decided to return to the Mayflower. When they returned to the ship, they were greeted with good news. Peregrine White was born, the second baby born on board the Mayflower and the first in New England. He was the son of William and Susanna White, likely a Leiden couple, though we're not 100% sure. A. White family was a prominent family around Scrooby, though and even John Robinson's wife was named Bridget White. 
Peregrine White would live until 1704, which just astounds me. And furthermore, he was born on the Mayflower, but his daughter would live to see the outbreak of the French and Indian War. Anyway, Standish took 10 people out in the shallop to find a new settlement site. These people included Carver, Bradford, Winslow, Hopkins, John Allerton, and John Clark. When they landed, they built a barricade and they started to explore the area, which, like all the others, seemed to be abandoned, with just some empty houses and yet more graves, as well as some wolf-like howling coming from the forest. They set up camp in the evening, explored the next day, camped again, but the next morning, as the sun rose, two men burst through the trees, shouting, They are men! Indians! Indians! Suddenly, the air was full of terrifying war cries, shortly followed by arrows. Standish fired a shot back, telling the others not to shoot until they could take aim. The arrows kept coming, and it was clear that Indian bows were stronger, faster, and more reliable than the English matchlocks. One Indian could have five arrows in the air at a time, much faster than a pilgrim could fire off even one bullet. And that was if they had their guns with them, but multiple settlers had left their arms in the shallop overnight as they slept. They ran back to try to get them and ended up getting trapped behind the boat but uninjured. Another settler picked up a burning log for light and ran to his comrades who were caught behind the shallop. This was a brave act, to be sure, but it was one which, in reality, just made the pilgrims easy targets in the early morning light. The settlers were forced to take shelter as best they could, shoot as best they could, and wait. One Indian started to approach them, and a pilgrim took aim, shot, and missed. But the blast did its job, and the attackers started to leave. Standish took a group of people to try to follow the man into the woods. They went about a quarter mile, stopped, shot off their muskets, collected 18 arrows to ship back to England, and decided to move on to a different settlement location. As they were sailing, a storm hit drenching the shallop's passengers with freezing water and breaking the boat's mast. With help from the tide, they rowed to a nearby harbor, and then on toward a sound a little ways away. As they made their way to land, they had to decide whether to sleep on board the boat or on shore. The question was, were they more afraid of being attacked or freezing to death? Freezing won, so they went ashore, built a fire, and slept. The next day was nice and sunny, and they found that they were safe from attack because they were on a heavily wooded island. They spent the day rebuilding the shallop's mast and then rested the next day, which was the Sabbath. On Monday, they explored. Again, there was no evidence of a nearby Indian settlement, though there, as everywhere, unburied human bones showed the area hadn't always been uninhabited. The harbor was big enough for the Mayflower. A fortifiable hill rose up from the beach from which you could see 30 miles on a clear day, with a freshwater creek flowing beside it. It was secure, it was navigable, it was uninhabited, and it seemed perfect. So they sailed back to the Mayflower with the good news. They were greeted with bad news, though. Scurvy had started killing people, including children, and Bradford's wife had fallen off the ship and drowned right after he went exploring. They led the Mayflower to the site of the future Plymouth Plantation, though, and they started to plan their settlement. They chose a location on a hill and chose a town layout based on the fortifiable Dutch towns, but the houses themselves would be built in an English style. Single men would stay with families so they could reduce the number of houses needed to 19, A cannon-equipped fort would provide security. On Christmas, they built their first house. People were dying at a shocking rate, though, of two to three per day. By the time they completed the town, they only needed seven houses. Over the next three months, over half the people in the settlement would die, and even of the people left alive, fewer than ten were healthy enough to tend to the sick, and 
and progress building the houses slowed to a halt. By the end of winter, only four families were left with all their members alive, the Billingtons, Hopkins, Brewsters, and Cooks. The Lideners were faring particularly poorly, and multiple entire families of Lideners died. By the end of winter, more than a fifth of the living children belonged to two families, the Hopkins and the Billingtons, neither of whom were Lideners. They looked to Brewster and Standish more than ever as their sources of strength. On the non-Lidener front, though, Christopher Martin died and was soon followed by his wife. Adding to the pressures of health and cold, the settlers feared that Indians were waiting for enough of them to die that they could easily finish off the rest. Weeks and months passed with no contact after that first standoff, which was odd and deeply unnerving. So they hid the bodies of the dead, and those bodies wouldn't be found for another century. And every so often they pulled everyone out, propped the ill against trees, and took out their weapons as a show of strength. Meanwhile, they were trying to make a life in the wilds of New England. You really get the impression that they were trying to live a normal life in an abnormal situation. In Jamestown, people had been drawn to the exotic and interesting aspects of life in America. But in Plymouth, the focus was on creating a town life that was as normal as possible. One day, for instance, two people went out with their two dogs, armed with nothing but sickles. They heard a cougar scream, and the mastiff tried to run after it. The people were able to restrain the mastiff, but there they stood, clutching their sickles and their dog, and only returning the next day after getting lost. Soon, Another settler had his first Indian encounter while duck hunting in some cattails. He saw some Indians pass by and heard the noise of more scattered through the forest. He ran to the plantation and sounded the alarm. Everyone dropped their tools, armed themselves, and prepared to fight. But the Indians never came. The tools disappeared, though, and later that night they saw a fire where the duck hunter had seen the Indians. The next day, they elected Miles Standish as their captain, and he went about whipping the men of the settlement into a fighting force. John Billington took the lead in opposing Standish's plans, and he strongly criticized the captain himself. Billington's family had already come into into conflict with the pilgrims before. They were northern English Anglicans who had joined the Mayflower expedition because they were poor and lacked opportunities in England. He himself was rebellious and his kids always seemed to be getting into trouble of one sort or another. We don't have any surviving records that tell his side of the story and we don't know within the Anglican church whether he tended toward Puritanism or a more mainstream ideology but it's clear that Billington didn't get along with the Leideners or Standish, who John Billington said looks like a silly boy and is in utter contempt. For Billington's latest act of insubordination, that is, opposing Standish's military plans, Carver threatened to tie his hands and feet together in a public display of humiliation but he never carried out the sentence. The colony had its first official military meeting on February 17th, but as they were holding the meeting, someone realized that two Indians were standing on top of a hill across the creek about a quarter mile away. The settlers got their muskets and reassembled, and then the two groups stared at each other in silence until the Indians gestured for the English to approach. The English responded that the Indians should come to them, but the pair refused to enter the settlement. Standish and Hopkins decided to honor their request. They took one shared musket and crossed the creek. They laid the musket down as a sign of peace, and immediately the Indians ran to their companions on the other side of the hill. 
they didn't see any other sign of the locals for the rest of the night. It was after this confusing and unnerving incident that the English finally mounted their ordinances, six iron cannons. And then, then, after the cannons were installed, Jones brought a goose, crane, and mallard for an impromptu feast, and the settlers had their first really pleasant evening since arriving. Almost exactly a month later, during another military meeting, a lone Indian began to walk slowly but confidently toward the settlement. The pilgrim sounded the alarm, but he continued forward, and soon he was on the edges of the town itself, and he was about to walk right in. People were beginning to panic until finally a couple of men stepped into his path and signaled that he was not to go in. He saluted them and spoke the first words that most of the English had ever heard a Native American say. Welcome, Englishmen. He stood in stark contrast to the English, tall, healthy, dressed in nothing but a loincloth with hair that was long in back and short in front, and no beard and carrying a bow with two arrows. The English, on the other hand, tended to be hunched over from sickness and years of manual labor, bearded and pure, bearded and prematurely aged. He stood confidently, even cheerfully, and they stood staring in disbelief. After the shock wore off, they offered him something to eat, and he requested beer. They gave him some liquor, and then offered him some biscuit, butter, cheese, pudding, and roasted duck, all of which he liked. He introduced himself as Samoset, a sachem from Maine. He had learned English from the fishermen who frequently passed through his region, but he told the pilgrims that there was someone from the area that they were living in, called Patuxet, who spoke English even better than he did. That man's name was Squantum, and the leader of Patuxet, the sachem, was called Massasoit. Then, Samoset told them more than they could have imagined about the region as a whole. Now, not all of what I'm about to tell you came from Samoset's story, but the basics did, and it seems like a good time to really give you the story of New England until this moment, from the perspective of the Poconokets. The first Englishmen to visit Patuxet had been members of Gosnold and Archer's 1602 voyage. In fact, Gosnold had presented Massasoit's father, who was the sachem at that point, with a pair of knives and a straw hat. After Gosnold, Martin Pring had briefly gone to Cape Cod to, har- to harvest sassafras, and he had left when a few locals set fire to his fort, but he was followed by Samuel Champlain in 1605. In 1611, Edward Harlow followed in their footsteps, and on his visit, he engaged in brutal confrontations with the Indians and ended up abducting five of them. One of his captives was named Epenau and Harlow took him around the London streets to show for money. Epenau started to realize that the English liked gold, and so he told Harlow that there was a gold mine in New England that only he could lead them to. They mounted a new expedition, and as soon as the English ship came within swimming distance of North American land, Epenau jumped over the side and escaped, and he soon became a sachem. In 1614, John Smith led his famous mission to explore New England with several ships, one captained by a man named Thomas Hunt, a Suffolk Puritan. In Patuxet, against Smith's orders, Hunt took as many native captives as he could hold for sale as slaves in Spain. He tricked 27 people, 20 from Patuxet and 7 from Nowset, onto his ship to be sold as slaves in Malaga. Smith lamented that Hunt had permanently damaged English-Indian relations in New England, and indeed stories of the incident spread quickly around the area. The next English captain to visit the area massacred massacred a trading party of native people, and this solidified local concerns about the English. 
In Spain, though, Hunt's captives were rescued by a group of monks. One in particular found his way to London, where he lived for about five years. His name was Squanto, or Squantum, and in fact, by the time that the pilgrim set sail, he had spent more time in London than any of the Leideners except for Brewster or Winslow. He'd stayed in London at the home of John Slaney, a leader in the merchant tailors who was closely connected to both Jones and Pocock, and who had invested in the Mayflower's mission. But the next year, in 1616, a French ship wrecked, and the Indians decided to get revenge. They killed all but three or four of the, crips, of the ship's passengers, and they kept those people as slaves, sending them between towns and making sport with them. One of the Frenchmen learned their language and told his captors that God was angry with them for their wickedness, and that God would destroy them and give their country to another people. Then, in the spring of 1619, a man named Thomas Dermer sailed south from, Ma south from Maine in a small boat on a mission funded ugh, on a mission funded by Ferdinando Gorges. He was accompanied by Squanto, who by now had lived in Spain, England, and Newfoundland, but who was headed home. When Squanto arrived, though, he found the area transformed. Once full of people, Patuxet was now virtually empty, though he did find a handful of survivors, including members of his own family, in his village. Patuxet had suffered a plague in the last three years. It had killed pretty much everyone, especially Massasoit's people, the Poconokets. They died fast enough that they that they couldn't even keep up with all the burials, hence the unburied bones. The Poconokets had once been one of the stronger tribes in the region, with 12,000 people and 3,000 warriors, but 90% of their people had died, warriors included. Meanwhile, the Narragansetts didn't, didn't seem to be affected by the disease, so they were at full strength while the Poconokets could muster only a couple hundred warriors. The Narragansetts now considered the Poconokets to be their subjects, and though Massasoit had allies, including the Massachusetts to the north and the Nassets on Cape Cod, he wasn't strong enough to fight them off. When he arrived in Patuxet, Squanto wanted to learn more about what had happened, and the situation in the region, so he got Dermer to take him to Massasoit. Massasoit welcomed the pair and even gave one of the French captives to Dermer, and they were able to rescue another one, and soon they met Ipanow, who was now a sachem. Squanto went home to his town of Namasket, and Dermer went south to spend the winter in Virginia. It was the most positive interaction that the Indians and English had had in years, but over the course of the winter, another sh English ship entered the Narragansett Bay, invited a bunch of Poconokets aboard, and shot them down in cold blood. Dermer didn't know about this, and expecting the kind of friendly reception that he'd enjoyed the previous fall, he returned to Patuxet in the spring. He was almost immediately attacked, multiple times, but they were minor attacks, so he continued his voyage. Then Epenau launched an attack which killed all but one of Dermer's men, and left Dermer himself badly wounded enough that he was forced to return to Virginia, where he immediately died. Squanto tried to save Dermer, but was himself taken prisoner and handed over to Massasoit. This was the spring before the pilgrims had arrived, and in addition to hostility and distrust of the English, a political rift had started to emerge in Massasoit's domain. The Indians knew that the English were likely to remain in the region, and that they might even increase their presence. A small handful of them knew English language and customs, meaning that they had an advantage in dealing with the English. English. 
This was a powerful thing, potentially beneficial, but also potentially disastrous if the power was wielded by the wrong person. Both Ipanow and Squanto saw their advantage, and it was for this reason that Ipanow had a deep distrust of Squanto. Ipanow had just demonstrated his loyalty to his own people by attacking Dermer in retaliation for previous violence, but Squanto kept playing games and had even protected the English. Massasoit had freed him, and by the time and by the time the pilgrims came, Squanto was living freely in Patuxet, though Massasoit didn't trust Squanto much more than Ipanow did. When the pilgrims arrived, the Indians had initially worried that they had come to avenge the attack on Dermer. When they'd taken corn and raided graves, they'd antagonized the Nausets, who were already hostile to the English after being victims of prior attacks and kidnappings. The Nausets were, of course, Massasoit's allies, and Massasoit himself was already wary after watching the events of the last decade. His first impulse was to curse the English and try to push them out. Squanto persuaded him to wait. He told Massasoit about London and said that the English could help the Poconokets establish their independence from the Narragansetts. Furthermore, he told Massasoit that the English had a black powder that they could use to spread disease at will. This was, of course, gunpowder, but the English did guard their gunpowder closely enough to lend credence to Squanto's claims. Even without the black powder, Continuing the bloodshed was dangerous. So, Massasoit avoided meeting the English while he figured out what to do. He knew how many settlers had died, and he also noticed that this group of Englishmen had brought women and children and made no attempt to trade. After months of waiting, he decided to try to befriend the English, or at least meet them so he could better evaluate them. Squanto offered to act as an interpreter, but Massasoit declined the offer, electing instead to, se- to send Samoset, whose English was poorer, but whose loyalty was surer. Finally, though, the settlers in the Poconokets had met. Samoset wanted to spend the night in the town, and the pilgrims hoped to dissuade him by offering to have him stay on the Mayflower instead. When he happily climbed aboard the shallop, effectively calling their bluff, they made some excuses about high winds and low tides preventing them from leaving shore, and allowed him to spend the night with Hopkins and his family. Neither side was quite sure of the other, but things looked promising. The next day, Samoset left, promising to return in a few days with Massasoit and his men. Thanks for listening. If you have any opinions, thoughts, or theories about anything we've discussed in the show, I'd love to hear from you either on Facebook or Twitter. And you can find those links at the website, AmericanHistoryPodcast.net, as well as links to firsthand accounts and things. See you next week.